Um, just going back to the advice that other men talk about um, is, is about breaking isolation, maintaining hope is a really important thing and valuing yourself. Hope is a really important thing that men highlight as, that as practitioners, you know, when they come with, with wrecked lives, that the installation of hope um, for them is really critically important as part of their recovery. Um, and having contact with other survivors is really important. And so it is very, diff very tough for men to walk into a group work situation and they need support mechanisms but it can also be very relieving at the same time. Um, so just some brief implications and then we should have some time for some discussion. Um, some implications for directly responding to, to men is, is the need to be able to receive some painful stories and sometimes men spoke about uh, feeling not feeling up that some practitioners were up to the task of hearing some really difficult stories, um, and, and instead they felt a bit like they were held in limbo, or that they um, the person got confused or flustered as a result of their disclosure or request for help, um, and therefore they felt it just reinforced a whole of the other effects about about the abuse that was, was about them, that they were to blame, that they were culpable in some way. Um, so, you know, some clear um, things about empathy and practical health, not just being, for it not just to be a cathartic exercise, but, but some uh, really practical things that can happen. Um, and a close and trusting relationship is really critical. Some, some other um, broader issues, some of which I've really covered and I won't spend a lot of time, but you know, again it highlights this need for the awareness at a broad level of professionals to be aware of the effects of child sexual abuse and be able to recognise behaviours that may be reactions to child sexual abuse. Um, you know, and one really example I've had from a recent experience in both here and in Australia is you know, the whole um, experience that of invasive medical procedures that can um, can influence people's or bring back memories or re-traumatise people. Um, so how we actually think about screening as well. The other thing is. We, we need to be aware um, that you know, some men might justify violence or abuse um, and this needs to be considered. It, it's, it's not a common thing, but it needs to be considered when we're responding to men. Um, I've got a question here from Ellie um, and says, I, I really like the idea of being the holder of hope for someone when they are unable to see it or feel it for themselves. Research and practice wisdom can be shared to give men hope when they are not able to see it and need the commitment to hope as well. Yeah, that's fantastic, um, really powerful. Yeah, um, just in response to um, the next question from um, uh, Moray, um, was the uh, do I mean violence towards others? Well, I think first of all that that's a, that's a, a concern um, that um, it could be framed within a re, uh, a revenge mentality against the perpetrator. Um, elsewhere, I, I've talked a bit about working with men that have um, um, revenge. Uh, feelings and have acted on those revenge feelings from in, anywhere from assaulting to murdering the perpetrator. But also violence that is, is uh, sort of less discriminatory um, and actually uh, it is justified on, on the basis of um, people's anger and feeling angry at society. And then through to you know, 
issues of domestic violence where where the victim of the men's violence might be invited into feeling that it's about their pain as a result of being a victim of abuse and therefore in some ways excusable and, and these are important things that we need to um, really, really think about. Um, and one example of that is um, uh, working with some young men who uh, were in prison that had been um, sexually assaulted some of their attitude was, well, I'll, I'll get in first. I'll, I'll, I'll punch first and ask questions later because I want people to know how much pain I'm in. And um, they don't even need to know what it's about. So this sort of response that uh, needs to be treated within the context, but also within the context of, you know, some of our ethics about violence. Um, Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Men often spread their anger, and and almost so, some of the men in some of the uh, work that we 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 did talked about, you know, deliberately getting into fights, and actually there was a mix of own violence perpetration, but also a degree of, of self perpetration because they'd often lose the fights uh, in terms of getting getting injured. Um, some of the points here I've, I've really already talked about, about coping strategies that perhaps we, we need to focus on in our um, work that offer practical, uh, positive approaches, um, ways that engage with um, coping that avoid some of the avoidant or disengagement, um, guarding against isolation. Um, and you know, I, I think some of the things is that some of the men I I saw in this research had been, uh, for example, attending psychiatry and and um, some counselling type things for a long, long time, and it was seen as it was largely a cathartic check-in that created a dependence and wasn't sort of practically based. So I think we need to really think about how we can not move men on, but also see that this this is something they can um, deal with and then it's not something that's going to have to dominate them through therapy as a replacement. Um, public awareness campaigns and, and stuff like live, what Living Well is doing at the moment is just fantastic. So that's really all I've got to say. It gives us sort of a bit of, I've got a bit of time now and um, happy to take questions. So thanks very much for your attention. It's an interesting experience talking down a, com talking down a computer to participants many uh, miles away. I'm just um, going to give people a little bit of space to uh, have time for answer questions. Um, it's interesting to see what happens. Okay, um, yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Um, yeah, look, I'm really appreciative of what you're saying. I see there's two people at least typing. You see in that window the speech button. There's more ads and how you typing. So uh, we'll just wait for those questions to come in before I leap in with anything. Uh, uh, particularly probably banal, I mean, but I'll, I'll say. But is it helpful for me to read the question again, or, or, or people have read it? I'm I think I think it is a good idea to read it again, actually, and then you can in the process be working out your response, you know how it is. Um, so I'll leave you I'll leave you to do that part. Terrific.
logistically prepared for all the questions to come at once. Because um, I can see three people are typing here at the moment. And, and simply, please remember this is going to be downloadable afterwards. And encourage people to come and uh, come and listen to this. Uh, and I know it's a weird experience because I've done it myself, Patrick. Uh, but uh, it's, it's it's fantastic. The line is great. We can hear you really clearly. Um, and we're clearly going to have to keep doing this and make this more popular. That's great. It's early now. Actually, um, you know, you spoke at the end about, you know, a number of times you spoke about the the, the question around cathartic relief and, uh, you know, like providing members with practical tools. Um, and also that you, you don't want to keep going this ongoing, you know, retelling and, and going over this, this stuff. Is there any particular sort of practice frameworks or, um, you know, Things that people need to consider, you know, like even when they're just initially meeting the man about setting up some ideas about that you can you can move beyond or you can live that this stuff is going to be a part of your life, but it doesn't need to dominate your life and, and change. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that that's a really critical aspect. Is um, in some ways um, some of the less helpful coping strategies that had create, can create a cycle and so counselling can be sort of come in as a bit of a another thing that might feel that, that that they can't do it on their own so to speak and um, that and that's where I think the, the previous point of one of the other que questions or comments in um, that someone typed I forget who it might have been Ellie um, is that the whole idea of bringing the other men's stories and practice with them and, and hope in and being a holder of hope, I think was was the term used. You know, can create that. You know, possibly you will get through this. It might not feel like this now, but there is a sense of of, of hope. And I think it also comes down to the quality of the relationship. I and mean, I think there's a lot of uh, research around now that you know people argue for a particular practice approach and there's all these sorts of things around. I mean some of the, the, the more systematic reviews of um, counselling approaches show that regardless of models used, the, the quality of the relationship between the professional and the um, client um, is, is the thing that most determines a positive outcome. And, and, and I mean, I think the other thing here too is that um, for for men to have some practical tools, where um, the, the use of document documenting means progress, means courage, means uh, um, growth and insights, can be a really important resource for men to then later call on. Um, when perhaps they feel like they might be going back to, to previous ground that